Good morning, everyone. Uh, we are now exactly at 10 o'clock. I uh, just want to let people know we're going to give people two minutes uh, more just to start uh, start trickling in. Welcome to the uh, the webinar. We'll be starting in two minutes. And once again, a quick good morning. We will be starting in one minute. Okay, by my clock, I think we're uh, we're just after two minutes past the hour, so I think it is time to kick this show off. So, good morning, good afternoon, welcome to the uh, to the webinar for uh, from wherever uh, wherever you're watching us from. This is, of course, our next quarterly release webinar. Uh, we are today releasing Happy Fire 6.1.0, as well as Smile CDR 2022 08R01. We do code name these releases, uh, and as always, we do that uh, we do these with alphabetical names. This week uh, or this this quarter, the letter U is up. So, what did we pick? We are calling this release the Unicorn Release Webinar. Uh, in fact, we're calling this this release the Unicorn Release. I guess I should say. So as always, we will be uh, sharing with you today what is new in the products, uh, what we've been working on, and we will close things out with some Q&A time with, uh, with myself as well as with, uh, with Ken Stevens, who is our, uh, our Director of uh, Product Development here at Smile CDR. So this is, of course, our 21st named release. Uh, exciting times. It, it, is, it is wild to me to think that, uh, that we've been doing this long enough, that we've hit 21 releases just since we started naming releases. Uh, we have burned through almost the entire alphabet at this point. I honestly have no idea what we're going to do once we, uh, once we get past Z, Z, however you want to call that, uh, that last one. I guess uh, I guess we'll have to decide that at some point soon, but for now we've got a few more letters left, left in the alphabet. Uh, we've actually, we, I think we've, we've got most of the rest of the alphabet mapped out as well in terms of release names. So probably we'll give some sneak peeks at, uh, at what the, the, the remaining releases will be called pretty soon. So a little bit on unicorns, of course. Uh, these are all facts that were new to me. I had no idea. I, I don't know how Scotland's national animal is the unicorn. Um, I think there is some debate internally here at Smile about whether it's true that a, uh, a Pegasus uh, has a, a horn or not. So I don't know about that one. Um, it's fascinating that there have been cave drawings all over the place with, uh, with unicorns on them. And I have no idea how we know that Labrador retrievers are afraid of unicorns. Uh, but I do know that I, uh, I had a Labrador retriever for a long time who was deathly afraid of horses. So it, uh, it, I, I, I mean, that's kind of the opposite of what this fact is, but maybe maybe it's true just by virtue of the fact that I've heard other people with labs say the same thing, that they don't like horses. Maybe they just don't like each other. I'm not sure. There we go. Uh, <laughs> that's, that's all I have to say about that. Uh, a couple, before we get into features, uh, a couple of high points, uh, high points to talk about. 
uh, you know, from uh, from around the world of, of Smile CDR and Happy Fire. First off, we are very happy. Uh, our partnership with an awesome company called uh, called Estrada, who do quality reporting, uh, reporting uh, have a reporting platform uh, that is powered by Smile CDR and adds all kinds of awesome, awesome functionality uh, for for report for measure reporting on top of it. Estrada and Smile have achieved NCQA certification with their uh, their combined offering, which is super exciting. Uh, Smile has also been certified by High Trust. Uh, that's a uh, very exciting development over the last quarter. We're uh, we're very proud of the team who have done that. And finally, Microsoft Canada um, recognized Smile CDR as the winner of the 2022 ISV Breakthrough Partner Impact Award. Uh, we're very proud of everyone who participated in any of these three activities. They're all uh, all super exciting things. So there we go. Uh, we started this last time around, and it was very well received by the community. So what the heck? We decided to make this a, a recurring thing. We are releasing a playlist along with our uh, along with our release. So the Unicorn release playlist is a collection of songs that was suggested by the uh, by the development team and the product team who. Uh, who brought you this release? Everybody uh, who wanted to contributed a song that was interesting to them. Uh, I think Ken Ken mentioned after he heard this, he said this really sounds like a summer playlist to me. So there we go. We're uh, we're getting towards the end of summer. I I, I hate saying that. At least uh, if you're in the northern half of the planet, that statement is true. Um, I I would agree. This is a real summertime playlist. So I might suggest give it a listen before before the summer is done, or if you're in the southern hemisphere, perhaps. Perhaps wait uh, wait a few months and then give it a listen and it will be it will be perfect to you then uh great stuff and uh, incidentally we will uh we will be publishing these links so if you want to scan the qr code and bring it up now awesome but don't worry this will be your last chance to get a copy of the uh of the unicorn release playlist it's a public spotify playlist as well um oh, and i see in the comments there's a unicorn on the canadian passport i did not know that that was the case i'm gonna go dig up my passport after this and find out if that's true I, I i'm not doubting it is so what is new i am going to start by saying um and you know got a got a level set with these things this is one of the less exciting uh exciting webinars in terms of big announcements for features that we have made this is not to say that there isn't a ton new in uh, in both Happy Fire and Smile CDR, I absolutely will encourage everyone to go and check out the uh, check out the updated change logs for both of those platforms. I will say that this release is really characterized, though, by a whole lot of of incremental improvements, and there absolutely are a ton of them. Uh, we've made lots of little changes, lots of little enhancements. We've fixed a lot of bugs. We've cleaned up a whole bunch of technical debt. So the team have been absolutely furiously working through uh, working through code over the last quarter. Um, unfortunately, it just uh, it's the type of work that doesn't lend itself to the, uh, to big announcements in a webinar. So we don't. It's, this is going to be a fairly short one in terms of uh, in terms of big ticket features. Uh, lots that lots is in the change log that we're not going to cover today because it just feels like reading a change log is it doesn't make for very interesting viewing. But uh, a few of the things that are uh, I think minor enough that I don't want to harp on them too much, but exciting enough that it, they were at least worth drawing our attention to are highlighted on this uh, on this slide today. Uh, here's a few of the little changes that are that are in here, and I'll I'll draw your attention to some of the bigger stuff that has gone on just because I I think it is there is some interesting stuff that we've done in the last quarter, tons of it actually. Um, first off, we have introduced an operation that is custom to Happy and to Smile. Uh, both of the this this feature is not a part of the core uh, Fire spec, but we have seen a bunch of demand uh, from the community and from customers who are interested in in this type of functionality. This is a custom operation that we're calling History Rewrite. History Rewrite, effectively as the name sort of suggests, allows you to go back in time and change old versions of Fire resources. Uh, this is useful in case cases where perhaps the you know you've you've done an import and there was something wrong with your import so you want to correct data or you've got some business justification for changing older versions of of data this obviously comes with significant risk um, this is the type of thing you only want to do if you're sure it's a good idea for that reason uh, this this operation of course is disabled by default needs to be explicitly enabled and in the case of smile cdr there's an additional permission you need to grant users if you want to allow them to do this so there's all kinds of checks and balances on this, but if you uh, if you have a situation where re rewriting history is useful, this is now a first order feature within the product. Uh, 
probably the biggest block of effort that we have put we've put into the last quarter in the platform has been adoption of our new batch framework this is the batch 2 framework that we have discussed over the course of the last i think probably two webinars uh, as we mentioned in previous webinars um, I guess it was last quarter, actually, it even says it right there on the slide. We introduced this new framework that allowed us to sort of execute smoothly long-running batch processing jobs. Uh, obviously, a modern fire server has all kinds of tasks that take a long time to do. These include things like re-indexing data, generating bulk exports, re re-indexing your terminology, importing large code systems, and the list goes on and on. There's all kinds of things that take a long time. Uh, and our previous batch framework just wasn't fitting the bill. So we've, uh, we've rewritten that. Uh, and now that we've got a scalable, distributable, load balanceable uh, batch framework built into the platform, we have spent tons of time, uh, we've spent tons of time going through all of the existing batch tasks and converting them to use the new framework. Uh, we've got it. We've got up on the uh, up on the screen a whole bunch of details about tasks that have been moved over. I think we are just about complete with that. So probably uh, any moment now we're going to have the last bat the last old batch task moved over, and we will move on to more exciting things. This is an under the cover improvement, to be clear, but a really really exciting one. Uh, this this ad tremendously adds to the scalability and durability and robustness of the uh, of the platform, which of course is. Of, of critical importance these days as people roll out uh, roll out great big distributed architectures that include a fire server as uh, as a core component. We've also spent a bunch of time uh, enhancing our MDM capabilities. The MDM or EMPI capabilities are a, uh, a perennial favorite. We uh, we're seeing increased adoption both uh, both internally by by small customers as well as out in the community. We've got lots of activity. Oh, I, I see a couple of comments saying the slides aren't moving. Um, I see my own copy moving. I'm hoping there's a reason for that. Let's try and reshare. Hopefully, uh, hopefully people can see an MDM enhancement slide now. Um, Eep. This is uh, we have, incidentally to everyone. We are we're using a new platform for streaming today, so hopefully uh, hopefully this is a, a one time glitch. But the new platform seems great. We're using a system called Restream, which seems pretty good. Uh, on on the MDM front, um, a couple of things we've changed there. So nickname matching, which of course is a, a huge part of, of using it, our MDM platform for EMPI purposes for person matching. Uh, being able to match on nicknames is of course important. The nickname matcher has been updated so that two nicknames will match each other. Uh, previously, they would only match to the root name that they were associated with, so that's great. Uh, we've also added a bunch of indexes to our linking tables to improve linking performance, and we continue to focus on performance enhancements to the MDM platform. Uh, we've got a whole bunch more planned over the uh, over the coming months to improve the performance of MDM capabilities as uh, as that platform continues to go. I really hope my slides are advancing. I'm now sharing one that's called HL7 v2 enhancements. Um, we do, of course, continue to work on our HL7 v2 integration capabilities. It is amazing how often these things are useful to people uh, people who are adopting Fire. Naturally, if you are adopting Fire in an environment where you've got existing data integration capabilities, the ability to talk HL7 v2 is pretty important. Uh, there's lots of HL7 v2 kicking around the world. Uh, among things that we have added, we've added a bunch of uh, custom processing capabilities uh, that allow you to add your own conversion logic for transaction types that we don't support today. Uh, as well as to replace built-in translations. So in other words, if you want to support a specific V2 transaction that we do not have a mapper for today, you can write your own now. Uh, that has been an, a, a long time request and that's finally in the product. You also do have the ability to completely replace our built-in translations. So if you don't like the way that we've handled ADTA 17, for example, you already had the ability to enhance our built-in translations. You've now got the ability to replace them wholesale, which uh, will be useful to people, I suspect. Um, we do also give the scripts the ability to reach into the original HL7 v2 messages uh, before, even before we try to do any kind of conversion. This is really useful if you've got malformed v2 messages coming in because it allows you to fix them before we try and convert them. This is, uh, this is often useful. Uh, we've also added, we mentioned last release webinar, we talked a little bit, oh no, what have I done? Wow, this is going well today, I apologize for that. Oh my goodness. Uh, we, we, oops, let's go back, oh no. 
Uh, we added we added the uh, the capabilities uh, to do remote debugging of JavaScript uh, JavaScript scripts in a uh, in the last release. We have now turned that on for HL7 v2, so it's now possible to remote debug. Uh, your HL7 v2 conversion scripts, which is useful. And we've added a troubleshooting log. The, uh, the SmileCDR troubleshooting logs are often useful when you're trying to debug specific issues. Uh, previously, there was no troubleshooting log for HL7 v2 capabilities. Now there is, so that is a very useful thing. In the Smart on Fire world, uh, anyone who is doing Smart on Fire is probably aware that there is an emerging specification called Smart v2 which takes the old smart scope definition language and doesn't entirely turn it on its head, but certainly uh, certainly adds a whole bunch of new capabilities to it. We have decided to embrace this uh, with wide arms wide open, uh, including the the including the, the parts of the spec which are considered to be normative, but as well as some of the experimental parts in there. And quite important to this, we have added support for what Smart V2 calls filter expressions. Uh, this is a huge topic, this, the Smart V2 filter expressions. Effectively, what they allow you to do is to embed little fire queries right into Smart Scopes in order to say, I am only authorizing access to data that passes this specific fire query. This, um, a simple example, and one that uh, is actually the original use case for wanting to implement this, is this does mean that if you've got a specific value set that codifies the specific types of data that you want to release, perhaps for, uh, perhaps for, for privacy reasons or something like that, uh, this does allow you to uh, this does allow you to specify your value set, uh, then create a fire search expression that matches that value set, and ultimately use that as a part of a, sm a smart scope that authorizes access to, uh, to data. I am seeing comments that our slides are not moving. I, I really apologize for that. I, I wonder perhaps, yeah, there we go. Oh, okay, so it's good now. Definitely, I'm sorry for the glitches. I will try and describe what's on the slides. I guess we're having some, some challenges with the, uh, the new platform. Sorry for that. Uh, on the MongoDB front, we continue to enhance our support for MongoDB as a uh, as a storage engine. Uh, we've got lots of customers using uh, using MongoDB for all kinds of things these days, uh, and we're slowly adding parity with the uh, with the GPA server in places where it makes sense. Uh, among things that have happened over the last while, we have added support for MDM on top of MongoDB, which is very exciting. Uh, that was previously a gap in our system. That's now implemented. We've also added support for Firepatch on MDM, which is great, uh, as well as support for the custom expunge operation, which uh, which which allows you to, to physically delete data out of your database. So expunge, uh, expunge has been a long time request in MongoDB. It's very useful for privacy reasons, for development reasons. So that all three of these things have been added uh, have been added to the repository. Uh, on the JPA server front in Happy Fire, I will mention two uh, two community contributions that are worth calling out. One, we received a community contribution adding support for a database called CockroachDB. Uh, CockroachDB uh, is I've always been puzzled by their name. It's uh, not the uh, not the uh, it's a bit of a strange name for a, uh, a piece of software, but it is a very well respected piece of software despite the uh, the, the unusual name. Cockroach is a large distri a large scale distributable database that handles ge geographic di distribution really well, scales really well. Uh, and we've had some demand from the community for support for that database platform. We have added an experimental support now. Uh, we would love to hear feedback on the mailing list from people who are taking advantage of Cockroach. I've been personally interested in it for a long time. I, I don't know a ton about Cockroach, but uh, I've, I've spent a bunch of time reading about it. And it really, at least on paper, looks like a super powerful tool. So I'll be really interested to hear what uh, what experience people have. Uh, we did also fix a, a fairly nasty bug uh, in H2. So this this was caused by H2, the H2 database. This wasn't actually our problem, but H2 uh, H2 changed a few things about their internals in a recent release, which caught, which uh, prevented resources larger than one megabyte from being stored. We have implemented a workaround that uh, that does now mean that resources larger than one one megabyte one megabyte can be stored. And thank you to uh, our community for contributing both of those and. Uh, finally, we do continue our work internally on 
a first order, an area of first area support for Elasticsearch. Uh, we have, of course, supported Elasticsearch as a backend for a long time in, in Happy Fire and Smile CDR for certain things, basically terminology uh, and full text indexing. But we have now added support uh, for basically what we're calling first order searching in Elasticsearch. This is the ability for regular searches to be performed using Elasticsearch as the backend instead of a relational database. Uh, this work continues. We've added a bunch of new things this uh, this quarter. This includes support for tag profile and security searching, uh, support for paging. Basically, correct. Uh, we've corrected the way paging works. We've added a bunch of documentation to that, and we've uh, improved support for synchronous searching as well, which is a, an interesting use case. I will draw your attention to the link on the screen. There is some great documentation about the uh, this new mode in Elasticsearch. It does need to be explicitly enabled, and there's some configuration to do if you want to try it out. Uh, it is an experimental feature, but it is one we are very excited about and one that I hope we will see mature over the coming months um, and eventually graduate up into, uh, into a top order Smile CDR product as well. So there we go. Uh, we'll talk quickly about the AppSphere platform and what's new this quarter there. Uh, certainly and primarily, I want to draw your attention to uh, a new tab in, in the AppSphere platform, which is the App Requests plat uh, the app requests feature. Uh, in the CMS 2023 proposed rules for interoperability and prior auth, uh, there's a section that indicates that overall, and I'm reading here, overall prior patient app request and admin approval processes must be time boxed so that the request from a patient to access their health information by the app of their choice is not overly delayed. Uh, we, this is, of course, still just a proposed 2023 rule, but we think that despite that fact, it is well worth getting ahead of it. So we are rolling out features that help that will help AppSphere users uh, ensure compliance to these coming rules. And the App Request tab is a big part of that. It's effectively sort of streamlines, streamlines the uh, the act of of onboarding new apps that are requested by by your members, by your patients, that type of thing. Uh, on the world of payer to payer, uh, we have continued to iterate and develop our P2P solution, the uh, the payer to payer solution, which allows data transfer from uh, of, of member data from one payer to another payer. Uh, this quarter, we have rolled out support for P2P on top of MongoDB as a storage backend, which is exciting. We've also integrated with AWS's Cognito solution. Uh, in order to uh, to provide support there. Uh, I will mention in the next quarter, a few things we're working on there include supporting multiple health plan data being transferred via a single request, which is exciting. Uh, another one, which is just a tiny bullet point, but actually a massive chunk of work we're, we're trying to figure out, which is supporting uh, member directed exchange, which is effectively this ability for uh, for, for data transfer to happen in the background via a, an instructed background job, which might happen with a, uh, a member driving it, but might actually happen via forms being filled out and some administrative user kicking off the transfer, which is very exciting. We're also going to spend lots of time thinking about the act of delegation, so effectively doing P2P for delegate users. These are all really complicated things, but uh, actually really interesting problems to think about. So we'll be spending lots of time over the next quarter working on these features as well in the P2P solution. Uh, what's coming next? Uh, other stuff we're working on. So I will mention uh, very importantly, and actually this top bullet, I guess I should say, this is not just Smile CDR. This is also uh, this is also Happy Fire as well. We are bringing support for Fire R4B and Fire R5. Uh, these, this is uh, scheduled to come. We've done loads of prep work for this over the last quarter. Uh, didn't quite reach the finish line in terms of turning on the R4B support, but all of the preparatory steps have happened now. So we're really close to getting R4B support in, which is really exciting. Uh, we will continue to work on CCDA, uh, CCDA imports. Uh, this is for basically supporting remaining sections and the ability to support additional US CDI data. Uh, we have an active development project going on right now to uh, to finalize that work it's not quite finished so that work did not land of course for the uh for the, the for the unicorn release but uh, hopefully well in fact certainly for the v release which is coming we'll be adding that work in and i had a question this morning if uh if that work is ready before before 
that before next quarter, would we be uh, willing to consider a point release? And I suspect the answer to that is yes. So if you're if you're anxiously waiting for uh, for better CDA import capabilities, don't worry, they're coming really soon. Uh, that work is uh, is very quickly progressing right now. We're also going to begin work on write operations through the Fire Gateway, which has been a uh, a longstanding request of the Gateway as well. So we've got a number of enhancements to the Gateway there, and of course we will continue our work on Elasticsearch as well as, a bill, as basically beefing up the, the branding capabilities in the AppSphere platform. Naturally, we have customers that operate as a single corporation but have multiple brands and want to have the AppSphere uh, product reflect which brand a, uh, an individual user should see, uh, basically which line of business is that, uh, that user logging into. So AppSphere is going to be working on improvements there. Uh, a few things to draw your attention to on our website, if you're interested, I will uh, point out we've got a couple of really interesting bits of, of, uh, of content to read, some interesting white, white papers that are up on the website. I'll draw your attention to all three of these. Uh, I will also mention uh, we will be at the uh, at Becker's Health IT, Digital Health and RCM annual meeting in Chicago. And I just realized I meant to add to this slide and I forgot. We will also be uh, teaching a Happy Fire course at the upcoming Fi uh, HL7 working group meeting in Baltimore in September. So uh, if you have any interest in learning more about Happy Fire or will be at the, uh, the Baltimore Connected Fund, come say hi and consider, uh, consider registering for the Happy Fire intro course that we will be, uh, we'll be teaching at that as well. Uh, and with that, this is everything I wanted to say about uh, about this release. I'm going to close with a little story. Um, I'm hoping my slides are still up on the screen and, and that they'll progress to the next one. Maybe this won't work, but I'm going to try anyway. Uh, a story that is complete coincidence. And this is, of course, Unicorn Release Month. I, I will say quickly, um, I, I, I saw online, I was browsing the Costco website uh, about two months ago, and I saw this unicorn floating party island, and I thought that would be hilarious to have for the next time we've got friends and we're sitting on a body of water. So why don't I buy this? And I, we, we, I, I went on the Costco website, and I bought this unicorn floating public party island. Uh, when it arrived, I realized that I hadn't, I hadn't actually looked at how big this thing was. And as it turns out, uh, this this floating unicorn party island. I can't even lift it on my own. It's so heavy. So I'm going to close with a picture of, of what I bought, not realizing its size. <laughs> this thing holds about 12 people. I thought it was going to be like a two-person thing. So I don't <laughs> probably made a mistake there, but it sure is hilarious to get this thing unfolded and inflated and on, on the lake. That's, <laughs> that's for sure. So with that, uh, let's, let's proceed to our Q&A. Awesome. Thanks, Jen. Yeah, it's great to see everyone joining us today. Uh, yeah, we'll wait for some questions to come through. Good job on dealing with the technical technical issues, James. <laughs> we had, I think we're using uh, what all the streamers use, apparently. So expected it to be good, but hopefully it'll be um, all sorted out for next time. Yep. Uh, <laughs> As we'll all appreciate, first time with a new platform always comes with hiccups, and there we go. Uh, this, this really, I, honestly, this is a, a, aside from the glitches with the slides advancing, which I'm sure we'll figure out, this actually has been a much better experience. I can actually see comments, um, which wasn't possible with our previous platform, so that's mm -hmm. nice. While we wait for people to uh, to come up with questions, and I, I, I will say, if you've got any questions about anything at all, Happy Fire or Spile CDR, by all means, throw them uh, throw them out there. We'd, we'd love to try and talk about them. While we wait, I will say, Ken has joined us. Ken, of course, oversees all of our core product development, and there was everything there is to say about this. Ken is actually on vacation right now and agreed anyway <laughs> to, uh, to join the webinar before getting in his car and driving away. So I thought I would ask Ken, tell us about what you're doing for your vacation. Oh, family's going camping at a provincial campground. So, and the forecast is currently for a, a big thunderstorm while we're setting up camp. So I really hope we beat the rain clouds. I hope so. Uh, looks like we've got one question coming through. Uh, so Hanan says, Thanks for the great work. Where could we find the gateway? Ah, there we go. So the Fire Gateway uh, is 
a component in Smile in Smile CDR. Um, it is certainly if you if you browse to smilecdr.com slash docs, that takes you to our online documentation. Um, and one of the, the major sections, you'll see a, a table of contents come up, and one of the major sections is called Fire Gateway. That gives all the details about the gateway. Uh, for what it's worth, if anyone is not clear on what this component is, it, it really is a neat piece of technology. Uh, it effectively is intended to be put in front of one or more, well, generally more than one fire servers, uh, and allows you to layer capabilities and aggregate capabilities from those fire servers. So, you know, if you've got, a, a, you know, you've got an enterprise, like a, an architecture where one of you know some types of data come from one fire repository and other other types of data come from some fire services for example uh, you can use the gateway to aggregate the data from both of those and present them ultimately as a single single fire endpoint to the end user fire clients who are calling into it uh, this, this of course as we move to a world of fire based data fabrics that are transforming organizations everywhere that uh, that use them and this is a, a common theme these days we do recognize that uh, it's it's you know some people just have a single fire server and that's it, but lots of people have much more complicated architectures than that, and a gateway sitting on top of it that sort of makes all of that complexity look as though it's not complicated at all is just a lovely piece of architecture on top of it. We've seen people do some really cool stuff with that gateway. Um, yeah, so while we're waiting for more questions to come through, I actually did have one. Uh, so I know a lot of our clients are interested in uh, the mapping from HL7 to Fire, like you mentioned, and all the inner workings of how it transforms from the different formats. Um, so I was wondering if you could give us just a small insight into what details are captured in the HL7 v2 troubleshooting log and how that might help. Um, some of our clients who are facing like a little bit of issue with with the unknowns of of how that mapping and transformation uh, works. Oh yeah, absolutely. That's a great question. So I will say to anyone who has not ever had the the joy of of working with HL seven version two mapping, um, I, I, I'm sure there's lots of people listening who have worked with interface engines before, perhaps even built interface engines, uh, and have had to convert data from you know one v two format to another v two format. Um, if you look at an HL7 version 2 message on its own, what you ultimately see is just a bunch of new line delimited segments. You've just got a whole bunch of segments and they're all named and they, they all seem to follow a certain pattern. One of the things that's not obvious if you're just looking at one of these messages without sort of understanding the underlying spec is that there's a really complicated group structure that underlies that standard. So. While you might see two segments where one follows the other uh, in the actual messages, what you might not realize is that one of them might be a part of a specific group that you have to navigate a tree to get to, and then another one is a part of a different group that has a different repetition structure. The whole thing is remarkably complicated under the covers. I mean, it's it's not actually that uh, that difficult to, to grasp, but there is more complexity than you see at the surface. All of this leads to challenges when you're trying to map that data, because if you want to access data from a specific segment, Segment, you need to sort of understand what is the actual structure of the message like as it has been parsed by the underlying HL7 version 2 parser. The main and initial reason that we added the, the V2 troubleshooting log was exactly to help solve that problem. The troubleshooting log gives a whole bunch of insight into the internal workings of our HL7 version 2 parser so that you can sort of understand if I'm looking for this piece of data out of this message, this is uh, this is this is ultimately where in the structure you would find that bit of information. This is the path you would use to get there and all of that. Hopefully that helps. Okay, got a few more questions coming through. Uh, so I'll start with the, the first one. Is there an ETA for database sharding, i.e. segregating multiple customer data? I know we had oh. some, yeah, I'm not sure specifically which database that refers to but just maybe you can give us an overview of where we're at with that sure yeah absolutely so um let's say we will split this out into mongodb and relational databases those two storage engines um on the world of relational databases we've actually supported sharding for a while now uh, we call that feature in smile cdr partitioning 
Uh, and partitioning can be used, partitioning is kind of a neat feature. It's designed to allow you to partition your data along whatever axis you think is appropriate to you. Certainly that would include building, you know, if you want to, to build different logical partitions where each one represented a different customer's data, and you wanted that data to be completely logically separate, you know, a, an individual user should only ever see one of those partitions. They shouldn't see data that belongs to a different customer than them. Uh, absolutely, our native partitioning capabilities would allow you to get there. You, you do have to sort of write some logic that sort of identifies how do we know which customer this data is coming from and how do we know which, which partition or partitions a specific user should have? Like there's a bunch of configuration you have to do to get that all set up. But that is handled absolutely today. Uh, it's a feature we've we've had for a while. We do continue to iterate and enhance it. So it is uh, it is getting better all the time. And there are actually a couple of partitioning enhancements that are in this release that, uh, that, that we're announcing today. But it is a feature we've had for a while. Uh, on the MongoDB front, we are actively developing that today. We don't support MongoDB partitioning in the Unicorn release yet, but we absolutely will be supporting that as of our V release. So in the next quarter, we will be finalizing that uh, that work. Uh, that that work is actually nearly complete as we speak. So that that will be coming pretty soon. Well, it's exciting. Yeah, I know we had a, a couple of clients uh, waiting on that one for Mongo. So we've got a few coming through now, so I'll just roll through them. Uh, next one, bit of a random question, but I thought interesting one. Uh, is there a way, oops, is there a way or a flag or a special header or something of the sort to not send PII from the fire service of protected information? Okay, uh, this this is a hard question. I'm not going to dodge it, but it is a tough one. Uh, the reason it's tough is, of course, it is really hard to sort of look at your clinical data and and make a you know make an objective judgment what is considered PII and what is not considered PII. Uh, I will say, I mean, depending on the jurisdictions you are in, there's really you know there's simple examples where it's obvious. I mean, the patient resource, almost everything in the patient resource, I think we could all agree would be considered PII. All of your name and your date of birth and your identifiers and your 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 spouse's name and your next of kin, like that, that's all very obviously PII. Uh, there's stuff where it's kind of a gray area. So, you know, let's say I've got an observation which contains a lab test, uh, but I have removed the reference to what patient it's about. Is that PII? That's a good question. I think there's a value call to be had there. I mean, if this is a routine, complete blood count that doesn't have anything unusual about it, and we don't know who it's for, I think that's probably not PII. I, we could probably agree with that. What if it's a diagnosis, uh, or what if it's a test for a really, really rare disease and it's a positive test? I mean, all of a sudden, that, that concept, even though it doesn't identify the person, it really probably does because there's very few people that have that disease. So this starts to get uh, get gray area. And then, I, I mean, there's stuff where it's even more gray. I mean, something like the identity of a practitioner. Uh, there are jurisdictions in the world where the identity of our practitioners are absolutely not considered to be PII. There are just jurisdictions in the world where they absolutely are. So there is uh, there's regional disparity even in terms of what P what is and what is not considered PII. All of this is to say it would almost be impossible for there to just simply be a flag that said don't send PII because there's no one definition for what is or is not PII. That's the bad news. Here's the good news. Uh, we have consent services, of course, built into both Happy Fire and Smile CDR that allow you to define the logic that effectively sort of describes what do you consider to be PII. Uh, and however it is you des you decide that, uh, you know, it, based on your local context and the type of data that you're storing in your server, you can define what is PII. And the consent services will absolutely allow you to enforce those rules. Consent services could certainly be used to, you know, per user or per flag or per account or per source IP, like, you know, you define what the logic is, and there's lots of options there. However it is you want to do it, the consent services will absolutely allow you to uh, to implement exactly the logic you're describing. There's also a bit of discussion going on uh, mapping Excel to data, Excel data to fire. Uh, so you do have CSV support, and I guess you can convert. Um, but yeah, James, is there a way to map Excel data to fire? 
Yeah, there's an interesting question. I mean, you know, my my usual answer to I want I've got a, I've got data in Excel and I want to get it into a fire repository. I mean, certainly my usual answer would be just export it as a CSV file. And we do absolutely today in Smile have capabilities to to map CSV data uh, into into Fire and ultimately store it. Uh, that includes through our ETL, which can be done synchronously, as well as through things like channel import, which can be asynchronously imported through through Kafka and done at a potentially very large scale. So lots of opportunity to get CSV data converted into Fire and stored. I would not say we've had a whole lot of requests for native Excel support. Uh, I don't know that it would be impossible. I mean, there are, you know, it, it is, I've, I've, in previous parts of my life, I have written applications that go and extract data out of Excel files and convert it to other formats and ultimately import it into systems. Uh, if there is a specific need to uh, routinely map Excel data, like you don't want a one-off convert it to CSV, but you just want to be able to throw Excel files into a into a pipeline and have them get automatically imported with some sort of conversion logic. Um, you know, I, I would say that there's nothing like that on our product pipeline right now. Certainly our roadmap does not have that feature, but it, it's not like it would be impossible. So it would certainly feel free to uh, file a request and, and suggest that as a feature. I, I, I don't see why we wouldn't consider it. Uh, I'll wait that feature request if it comes through. Uh, next one, is there anything current or planned for initiating requests to other fire servers as a client? Huh. So on this one, I mean, I suppose we'd, we'd it'd probably be interesting to hear a bit more detail in terms of what you've got planned. I do. I mean, interestingly, there was a similar question posted to the happy mailing list the other day. Um, and I mean, for what it's worth, the answer I gave there was the, the fire server component, which is the part of the fabric we're talking about, I think, here. Um, the, the server really is intended to be a server and only a server. Uh, you know, it, it provides a bunch of APIs that can be used to call and inject and, and ingest data and things like that. Uh, it does not provide the ability to sort of go out and fetch data. There are some exceptions to that, but by and large, you know, it's the server. You write code that's going to talk to that server as a server. Uh, a couple of exceptions in Happy Fire do include our bulk import capabilities, which allows the Fire server to go out and fetch bulk exported uh, data, like NDJSON from remote sources, and import it. Uh, this also includes our ability to um what was the other one this also includes subscriptions which you know subscriptions will make outgoing calls which will transmit data to as a client as a fire client to other fire servers so there are a few capabilities there certainly you know as we move beyond just the fire server and into the, the broader smile cdr data fabric i mean there are lots of capabilities there for initiating outgoing requests uh those would include things like um i mean you know the etl logic can be used bulk import can be used. Uh, we've got capabilities for, we talked about earlier, CDA importing, NHL 7 v2 importing. So there's lots of sort of adjacent capabilities to this, but I, I think really to do this justice, we probably need to talk a little bit more about details. Um, certainly, I mean, there is a discussion active on the Happy Fire mailing list around this right now, and, and very happy to keep that going if there's, there's sort of more information about what you're, you're looking to do there. Looks like the questions might be slowing down. Hopefully I have captured them all. Great questions this month, of course. These are all uh, all interesting things. Yeah, it's always interesting to see what comes up. Or it's always a bit of a surprise to me. <laughs> I got, you know what, David, uh, David in the comments, I noticed pointed out, uh, there is one of the other things, I didn't talk about this in the release webinar, but we did put a bunch of work into beefing up the documentation in the Smile CDR docs about, about the concept of groups and how those groups work and how you might, you know, how you can navigate the tree structure of V2 messages and stuff like that. Um, I, every once in a while, I get, I get really enthusiastic and I write a bunch of documentation about something. <clears throat> that was the thing I personally did over the last quarter. So if you want to learn way more about HL7 version 2 grouping and how to work with them, uh, there is a bunch of new docs in there that, uh, 
I'd love to, I'd love for it to be useful to you. And I'd also love to hear feedback on because I don't even know if they're good. I just think they might be. <laughs> One more coming through. Uh, how to implement an analysis operation to calculate patient risk and make an observation about risk. Ooh, wow. There's a, there's a, there's a big topic, no question. Um, there's lots of ways you could do this. I mean, of course, you know, one simple thing you could do is, uh, you know, is, is just simply implement all of your logic as a sidecar application that talks to the fire server, loads the data it needs, performs the calculation, and and spits it out. I mean, that that of course is always an option you've got available to you. Um, other things you can do. So CQL as a technology feels like the right place to go with this. If you have not before heard of or looked at the clinical quality language or CQL, uh, CQL provides a standards-based approach to writing up queries that do things like calculate risk scores. Uh, they can be used for all kinds of other things, quality reporting, clinical decision support, calculations. There's, there's a whole bunch of really great use cases for CQL. Uh, Certainly, I don't want to do, you know, I'm not going to do this entirely justice here, but I will mention CQL is a, an absolutely lovely technology. Um, I do see a follow up comment that this CQL, of course, is going to be slow if we've got half a million patients. That's absolutely true. Uh, it is worth mentioning. Um, we have we've, we've developed over time a, a very great fondness for a great group of people at a company called Alfora. Uh, Alfora are among the, uh, they're among the group who ultimately developed the, uh, the CQL standard uh, and are certainly thought leaders in that standard. They, in fact, developed the reference implementation, the open source implementation that is usable along with Happy Fire and can be used to uh, can be used to execute CQL queries. It does a great job, um, and I've seen it used at some really interesting uh, interesting scale as well. Uh, it, it, I will mention they've also got a product that is built on a slightly different architecture, does sort of integrate nicely with the rest of a fire ecosystem, but is designed for much larger scale. So if your use case is CQL at large scale, I would absolutely suggest have a chat with Alfora. They've got an awesome product that, uh, that does exactly that. And just to confirm, so C CQL can insert into fire resources? So CQL, I mean, I guess it depends on what you mean by that. I mean, CQL is not a technology that on its own is going to go and modify your existing fire resources. That That is not one of its aims. Uh, it's more intended to sort of look over a collection of resources or even a population of resources and perform calculations or aggregate calculations or individual calculations. There's a bunch of, uh, a bunch of sort of specific use cases there. It does sort of spit out an output, which is a brand new fire resource. Um, so, you know, the, the output of your calculation Calculations will produce new fire resources, but it's not going to modify existing ones. But I suppose you know if if what we're asking is does it does is its output fire? Yes, it is. Okay. Uh, this one is there a way to handle in-memory caching between happy fire servers? Ah, this is an interesting question. Um, so caching, I mean, caching, of course, is a, I mean, a, a very big and very important topic when you're uh, when you're standing up fire servers. Certainly, um, the Happy Fire server does have an in-memory cache built into it. Uh, if, you know, if, if you're the type of person that wants to go digging uh, digging through the code base. There's a class in there that's actually called the in-memory cache service, and that's the place where we aggregate all of our caching logic. Um, that caching is used for, for example, uh, caching the results of terminology lookups so they can, they can be used to speed up validation processing, uh, lookups to our package repository, really anything that sort of involves looking up data in order to perform tasks. There is a great caching layer that helps speed that up. Uh, it also does things like cache resolution of resource IDs um, and resolution of match URLs, which can help with data ingestion and data lookups and all kinds of other use cases like that. So there's a pretty interesting uh, caching layer that's in there. That memory cache layer today is not a clustered memory cache. Uh, the, the between Happy Fire servers, I think, is probably the key to this question. Uh, it's not a distributed cache where individual lookups are, are sort of shared across the entire cluster. They do remain within memory. And if the same, for example, the same code is looked up on two processors, uh, then 
those those that'll be two memory lookups or two lookups which we'll ultimately insert into each respective local cache uh the the whole reason that we've aggregated this into a central service is to enable enhancements in the future and we have absolutely talked about distributed memory caching as a future thing so that is a uh, an area we're going to go the other thing that i'll mention is all of fire itself the fire standard is of course a restful standard fire has gone to great length to make sure that we are completely compliant with all of the great features that are built into the underlying HTTP specification. That does include really good support for things like the cache control header, like the e-tag uh, header, um, things like that. All of that is done in order to enable caching proxies to work appropriately on top of Fire Server. Uh, of course, a very popular architecture sort of in the broader world of distributed internet applications is you know, having a, an application server that is fronted by something like Nginx or Squid Proxy or something like that. It is worth mentioning that all of the technology to support those types of use cases is present in the Fire spec and is fully implemented within Happy Fire and Smile CDR as well. So uh, caching layers at, uh, at the, the tier above your Fire server is also possible. I guess that's what I'm trying to say. Let's jump in and mention one other thing is that uh, Smile CDR does support integrating with Infinispan. Um, or what Red Hat calls data grid, uh, which customers have used for um, search layer caching. Yeah, that's a great one. Thank you, Ken. I uh, also just wanted to touch on the CQL. Uh, Richard came back and said, as an example, CQL is currently part of the burden reduction implementation guide track that will let a payer help pre-populate a questionnaire resource with information in an EHR fire server. So the CQL then defines uh, those rules. And that helps the EHR fire server fill their own data in a fire resource, such as the questionnaire response. Absolutely. Thank you for that, Richard. It's it's interesting. I, I, I feel like a, a year ago-ish, I remember saying that CQL was almost a sleeper hit in the FHIR standard. It was a thing that had great potential, but outside of a small group of people, not that many people knew it existed. I feel like that has really changed in the last year. We are seeing incredible interest from the FHIR community at large around the CQL standard. Um, both in terms of, of adoption of it, but in terms of people sort of recognizing its power and starting to plan out its use and implementation guides and solutions and projects and that type of thing. Um, I, I think we're only starting to see the, uh, see the beginning of that. I think CQL is going to be a, a big story in the months and years to come. So if you, uh, if you haven't played with it yet, I'd absolutely recommend uh, checking it out. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I got to echo that. I, I'm super excited about the future of CQL. It's a big industry to uh, to do data analytics on, on on healthcare data and calculate quality metrics from it. And and that work in the past has all been one off um, work from from claims data or EHR data. Uh, and now it can be standardized. If, if your data is in a fire repository and you grab the CQL for it. You're done. You don't have to do any of that custom work that used to have to be done in the past. Um, I see huge, huge opportunities with CQL. I'm super excited about it. Yeah, there was a lot of interest at uh, Fire Dev Day for me too. One of the talks there, I had to sit on the floor. It was that popular. <laughs> see many more questions coming through. I'm going to bet that the talk Jenny was talking about was with Bryn Rhodes, who is one, mm -hmm. of, the, uh, one of the leaders in that space. It's, uh, it's always inspiring to listen to somebody talk about something that they know everything about. And Bryn is, is such a character for, uh, for the CQL standard. It's really interesting to listen to. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, I will say that, James, I know you touched it on, on it in the beginning, but uh, I think for me personally, the biggest takeaway for this release is not only the, personally for core as well, um, not only the features and enhancements that we're building for core that are valuable and useful for our clients, but also how we are building support uh, for other products within Smile, such as P2P. So yeah, it's been great to be exciting a part of that uh, supporting other products and growing and developing those as well. 
Absolutely. It is, uh, it is, it is very inspiring. I mean, as a, as a team, we do continue to grow and as we grow, certainly the product family is flourishing and we're getting better and better at sort of making all of those products play well together and making them sort of work as a seamless integrated data fabric, which is our, uh, our vision for, uh, for how the world is going. So it is absolutely neat to see that, uh, that continue to grow. Yeah, I don't see any questions coming through. Anyone had any last minute things? Well, I am going to leave us, I think, with a link to the playlist. Uh, if anyone wants something to do right later today and wants to listen to some music, fire up the uh, fire up the playlist. I see Dietrich says I want he wants to see the unicorn again. So in a minute I'll put that up once more and then we'll close. <laughs> Crazy unicorn. All right, why don't we leave it there? We'll uh we will pop back to the unicorn. That's the uh, that's the unicorn waving back at us. Thanks everyone. Have a great day.